The culture of entitlement at Manchester United that's poisoned the squad in the dressing room for years since Fergie retired has been a major reason why we haven't been able to really take a massive step forward as a football club. And everybody hopes that Eric Ten Hag can come in and show a real ruthless side and get rid of that. What I want to do in this video is run through some examples of Ten Hag's ruthlessness as Ajax manager and go ahead Eagles over his career to show you and give you a bit of insight into what we can expect from Eric Ten Hag when he comes in as Man United's manager. And also I'm going to take a look at the meticulous side to his coaching and why both of these two things together can create the perfect storm that this dressing room needs at Man United. So it should be a fascinating video, if I do say so myself, uh, giving you some real insight into what we should expect. So make sure you do subscribe if you do enjoy it by the end of the video. Lots of research goes into these sorts of videos, so I hope you do enjoy them. And make sure you hit the notification bell as well. But there's one clear example that stands out straight away, and I'm sure you might have seen this video going around. And let me play it for you if you haven't. Now, that video there is a video of, well, I don't tell you that, Eric Ten Hag shouting at one of his players, Noah Lang. He's a player who was a burgeoning talent at Ajax, scored plenty. I think he scored a hat-trick on his debut. And Eric Ten Hag there, during the game, tell him to shut up, listen to him, listen to his instructions. He didn't. What happened? Noah Lang was shipped out on loan a month later and then sold to Club Bruges. It was a real example of a ruthlessness from Eric Ten Hag to get rid of a player who wasn't simply listening to his instructions. Could have kept him, could have kept him at the club, but he was like, no, sod this, get out of the club. And that ruthless aspect is something that we definitely need inside this squad. Now, this is an interview from Noah Lang on the situation. And this is what he said after the fact. He said, it is clear that things were not right between Eric Ten Hag and me. Everyone loved me at Ajax except for one person. Many people think I'm a funny, cheerful guy who can play football well. However, not everyone could, do with, could deal with that. The moment I indicated that a transfer would be better, I was no longer in his plans. So he was the one who said to Eric Ten Hag, yeah, maybe it's best I leave. And Eric Ten Hag at that point, you don't want to play for Ajax? Gone. See you later. And that's something we desperately need at United. Isn't it, isn't it weird how it's changed over the years? It's like players don't want to play for the club anymore. But they, oh yeah, like it's an inconvenience to wear the shirt. You, there are a lot of players in this United squad you could associate that with. And that lower laying example really is a good one. But trust me, there's so many more I'm going to show you in this video, both from a ruthless and a meticulous side of things. Now, this one was... Uh, one which ultimately backfired for Eric Ten Hag because he dropped Sebastian Halle for the uh, for the Dutch Cup final against PSV and played Brian Brobby instead. They lost two one, and Halle was the top scorer, and it was it was a decision that was kind of met with raised eyebrows in Holland. Uh, Andrea Nana was the player who was dropped completely from the squad altogether. The goalkeeper, who of course I believe signed a pre-contract agreement, I think it was with Inter Milan um, or Milan, one of the Serie A clubs. And, and that there was a controversy about him being involved in mistakes leading up to the final. He just got dropped altogether from the squad. So that there example shows a real ruthless, a ruthlessness story in being able to make big decisions. Even if they do, obviously that one ultimately went wrong. So I'm not using that as a prime example of making a ruthless decision and it flourishing. But making the decision itself is something that not every manager would do. Playing players on form or playing players by name. You know, we've spoken about that quite a lot. I have anyway. So I think both of those two examples show different sides to Eric Ten Hag. This one here is going to be a really fascinating one. I've spoken to uh, Josh McLaren, who's Steve McLaren's son. And he's agreed to let, me, to let me use some of the snippets from the video of his interview with his dad, Steve, about Eric Ten Hag. I'm going to do a full video on this later in the week. But this one here really gives you an insight into the meticulous side to Eric Ten Hag and the obsessive, almost obsessive nature that he has. And that's something he definitely learned from working under Pep Guardiola. And I met him on the first day and we were training the next day. And this is obviously I at FC 20. thinking pre-season. I've just got the job, press conference, then I'm going to meet Eric and then we're pre-season training tomorrow. So I said to Eric when I met him, Eric, you know, what have you got for tomorrow? What have you got lined up? Um, let me get into it. Then we'll have a talk about 
you know, the six week plan ahead for pre-season and your thoughts and, and my thoughts. Well, he just produced this document folder. It was so thick. And every day for the next six weeks was documented in that folder. Every minute of every day. From every minute of every day. Like, I won't go into it too much detail because as I said, I'm going to do an actual full video on this. But that attention to detail, that obsessive detail, it's something that not only Steve McLaren there, as I said, Steve's coming in as our assistant manager. And I'm actually going to be speaking to Josh, his son, on a podcast, on the United People's Podcast at some point soon, just after the announcement is made, because I really want to get some insight into that. That'll be a fascinating interview. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast if you hadn't already. It's on Apple and Spotify, Amazon, or anywhere. Google too. But that there is, is not something that only Steve McLaren has said. Now, this one here, I'm, I'm going to run through an interview. There's there's two or three interviews I'm now going to run through from players who have played under Eric Ten Hag. And they all reiterate the same sort of thing about, about that attention to detail that Eric Ten Hag has. And that's a characteristic I think he definitely learned from watching Pep Guardiola. Uh, if you, That's always something that's said about Pep, his real obsession with every single minute detail. And as Steve McLaren said there, it was day one of preseason didn't expect much a six week document every minute of every day planned that sort of obsessive nature is is a sort of discipline that this united squad needs now this is an interview i can't remember his name let me go down here and see what his name is marnix colder this is marnix here he played with eric ten Hag at go ahead eagles he was there for a year and listen uh, i'm going to read through a couple of uh excerpts from this interview he did with i think it's the independent let me check Yes, with the independent. It's really fascinating. Let's, go, let's run through it here. This one here, he said, he was a serious trainer who knew how he wanted it, but how he wanted to keep control of everything. Always wanted to be in control. We go down here. Even if we had to do runs in the woods to show him we were fit, we tried to do it in 150. If, if Eric Ten Hag said, okay, you got two minutes to do it. He said, no. I say two minutes. It's not 210. It's not 150. It's two minutes precisely now when it comes to attention to detail sometimes obsession can work against you but from every interview from every player former player former manager assistant manager in steve mclaren they all use it as a, a as a compliment towards eric ten Hag. that that obsessive nature not only makes the players better but makes the team an actual team and then we go down here and we see and we hear a bit of insight into the sort of training sessions that Ten Hag used to have. have. And that idea of the uh, shadow football, playing 11 against zero, basically using the formations and getting the players used to being in certain positions. It was really boring, uh, Overgore. Overgore, the, uh, he played underneath, underneath. Who the hell was Overgore? Am I mixing? I think I'm mixing interviews here. Apologies about that. Um, but it still gives the insight. But he wants us to focus and try it every time, again and again and again. Slowly after many hours in the training ground, the rotations became almost automatic. When I had the ball, Marnix Calder, who was the first person in this interview, sorry, I didn't realize they mixed interviews there, uh, would know exactly what to do. The left forward would know what to do. After a couple of months, we already knew, oh yeah, this is why we played 11 versus 0 4. We'd see that way Eric wants us to play, and we play like that. And that's something that is actually fundamental to the Eric Ten Hag system. Is making things second nature. Doing things so many times in practice and training, repeating, repeating, re repeating, to the point that when you actually then go and do it, it's automatic. You don't have to think about it. It's subconscious. You're already doing it before you, your legs are doing it before your brain tells you because it's just automatic. That is what is needed to get this Eric Ten Hag system in. And that's why he's got to be ruthless. With players like Lang, who speak out against it, if he allows that to exist in the squad, he's going to be undermined. And that, um, that show of power and that main maintenance of control is so needed at Manchester United. That's why I find these interviews fascinating. It's what Daley Blind was saying. Well, he didn't actually say this, but it was used as a source. Blind has been passing on information. Blind, according to sources, has stressed that Ten Hag has developed a reputation within the Ajax dressing room for putting the team before any in individual player and obviously pointed towards the fact that he did drop Haller for the final. We need that. 
we're, we're, we've been a bunch of individuals for so long. We need that team collective to come back because United are not a sum of their parts. We've got so many great individual players that just, we just don't turn that into wins. We don't turn that into performances. That's really is fascinating. And again, you want another example of ruthlessness here? I think this is from a, it's a striker that Ajax signed in 2017 called Hassan Abande. And uh, on his first, as I said, his first preseason game, did an ankle ligament injury, was out for a year. And this is what he said when he came back. He said, after my serious injury, I hope to get back playing as soon as possible. But after one half in a practice match, Ten Hag threw me out of the dressing room and sent me to the reserves. Mentally, I was left to my own devices and I tried to talk about my situation, but got no answer. According to Mark Overmars, it was the manager's choice that I had to accept. It's a difficult situation to accept when you never got a real chance. Now, I don't particularly say that I agree with that idea that somebody can be out for a year, come back, and then just gets dusted off. But it shows, again, a bit of emotionless ruthlessness. We need that, man. We need somebody who can objectively look at Sonic and say, no, nah, even if it's the wrong thing, to, even if it will be a nice thing to do to give somebody an extra year contract, even if it will be a nice thing to do to play a, a, a player for a couple of games before the end of the season. Niceties have got United nowhere. We need to start being arseholes again. Because there's too many arseholes in the dressing room. Because the manager has, hasn't been like that and has pandered to them, they've taken advantage of it. And there's more examples of Eric Ten Hag. This, this one in particular here from William, from William Jansen. And he played with him under, uh, at Utrecht. Here's a perfect example of how this approach has worked for Eric Ten Hag. And this bit here is really, really, really important. It's so what William said about Eric Ten Hag. He gathers a number of leaders around him from within the squad who understand what he wants and they pull the group along. At Ajax, he did that with Tadic and Blind, Klaas Jan Huntelaar and David Klaassen. But Eric is also good with the street boys with scars. For example, at Utrecht, he brought in Zakaria Libad, La Labad? Labiad who was not fit and had been written off by many. And a year later, he was the Eredivisie's best attacker. That there, that idea that he gathers a number of leaders around him is something that I think should probably put a big smile on the faces of a lot of United fans. And also, is a big reason why I keep pushing the idea of Frankie de Jong, of Yuri and Timber, of why I think Donny van der Beek could come in and have a really significant impact, certainly in the training and, and helping Ten Hag establish his system. He needs that group of leaders to weed out the wrong work ethic, the wrong culture, and embed this new one. It's not something that Ten Hag will be able to do on his own. That's why I'm really happy that Mitchell van der Gag's coming in as his assistant manager from Ajax. And also why I'm happy about Steve McLaren. I haven't really spoken about that in too much detail. Um, I would be fascinating to do that interview with his son, Josh. But I think if, Steve, if, if Ten Hag wants Steve and he wants Mitchell van der Gag, then I support his decision to do that. He'll be doing it for a reason. And of course, his relationship with Steve is based on what happened at 20. And as Steve said in that little snippet I had earlier, that meticulous attention to detail, such a fundamental part of Ten Hag's coaching style. And as you can see here, this is a nice way to end this video because I've, I've, it's nearly 15 minutes here. We've been talking about the ruthlessness and the meticulousness of Eric Ten Hag. And it also... It, Almost brings him across as this very hard to approach man, manager, and character. And I thought this little bit here at the end of the interview with William Jansen was really, really nice. My best memory of Eric Ten Hag is when I saw him at his most emotional. It was the weekend we qualified for the Europa League through the playoffs. We had lost 3 0 to Altmar in the first leg, and no one gave us a chance. A day before the match, Eric was missing, and we heard he was in hospital with his son, who had been in a pretty serious traffic accident. It was uncertain whether he would be at the game. On Sunday morning, he was there and he did the meeting. He said, my son has miraculously survived this accident. Now it's up to you to make a miracle too. And of course, you know what happened from that point on. I, the, the, uh, Utrecht, sorry, they went through. They overturned that 3-0 deficit. And the players played for their manager, who they saw was, of course, suffering after what happened with his son. I'm just, I'm all aboard the Eric Ten Hag type tra hype train, not type train, weird train. I'm all aboard it and I will keep pushing propaganda. I, I want to try and bring as many different types of videos like this to show the different assets, the different 
sides, the different faces of Eric Ten Hag from the meticulous coaching side that's going to come in. And we need that, man. We need that system and we need that coach to embed an identity into the club. The meticulousness will help with that. But also the ruthlessness, getting rid of Noah Lang, dropping Sebastian Haller and Onana from the squad altogether. Um, Hassan Abande, that player there, came back from preseason after a year out, booted straight out of the club. We need that ruthlessness. If we're to get rid of this culture of entitlement that's at the club, combine them all together, and it's a recipe for success. And I'm excited for it. I hope you've learned something in this video. If you have, uh, please drop a like on it and subscribe to United People's TV. As I said, I'm going to do a deep dive video in that Steve McLaren interview. And I'm really looking forward to that one. But hey, I can't wait for Ten Hag, man. I can't wait. I'm sure you can't either. And after watching this video, maybe even more.